the one who receives our alleluias is here gathered in this place and he greets you with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the mighty and transforming work of his Holy Spirit. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen to deed. Alleluia. We welcome all of you to worship here this morning at LaGrave Avenue Christian Reformed Church. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're watching online, we're delighted to have you part of our worshiping community this morning. And if you are a visitor, we extend a warm welcome to you. Or if you're a newer member or have been a regular member, regular visitor rather, uh, there is a visitor coffee that takes place after the service. Go through the narthex, down the hall. It's on your left-hand side in the parlor. There'll be some people there from the welcoming committee who would love to visit with you. And also, there is a um, newcomer's meeting this Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. That, too, will be in the parlor. There's more information about that in the bulletin. But there, too, if you are a newer member or a visitor or someone, perhaps, who's interested in membership here at LaGrave, we welcome you to join us Thursday night at 7. And then one other announcement tonight. We welcome one of our missionaries um, who is sponsored by the Henry Beats Mission Society. Telecent Morissette, who serves in Haiti, will be here. He and his wife, they'll give an update during the service. And then you're all invited to a, a light dinner in the multi-purpose room afterwards where he will give more details about his work. If you've watched the, no, the news, you know that um, there is a lot of unrest in Haiti and yet the gospel continues to go forth, and so you'll hear some of that tonight, so we encourage you to, to, to attend. As we think about the God who we praise, he is holy, and he is righteous, and he created us in his image, and yet we don't achieve to that same goal, that same holiness, that same righteousness, and that can discourage us at times, but he doesn't want us to be discouraged. For in the book of 1 John, he has these words for us. He says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, which we all have, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world knowing that we have an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let us come to God in a time of confession using the responsive prayer that you find in the order of worship. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. Yet we have not always bowed before him, nor acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people who proclaim you as Lord in all we do. Having confessed our sins, hear these words, this good news that we hear from the book of Ephesians. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Children, I invite you to come forward for the children's message. Come and join me down front. Come on down. Come on down and have a seat. It's good to see all of you here. I think some are still on spring break, but some of you are back. Maybe some of you never left. It's good to see all of you. Good to see you all here. Come and have a seat. Have a seat. Good morning. All right. Now, I have my Easter basket. How about that? Is today Easter? No, no it's not. Hmm. When was Easter? Do you... It was last Sunday. Exactly. Okay. So, I'm, am I a week late? Sort of, right? Sort of. And yet, sort of not. Okay? Because even though last Sunday was Easter... In the church, we celebrate Easter not for one Sunday, but for seven Sundays. It's called Easter Tide. That's kind of a strange word, Easter Tide, but it just means Easter time. Easter time. Okay, so for seven Sundays. Can you show me on your fingers seven? Five on one hand, two on the other. Okay, everyone got that? Okay, yeah. So last Sunday was the first one. 
Here's the next one. And then we have five more Sundays that we get to celebrate Easter. It's such an important day to celebrate the day that Christ rose from the dead that we do it for a whole season. You do that in your children's worship class too, okay? Because white is the color for Easter. Stoles are still white. The banners are still white. Reverend Bass requested that we sing, sing Easter hymns today. We're going to sing Easter hymns tonight at the evening service too. Okay, Easter's a big deal, all right? So we celebrate it for seven Sundays. Now, before I let you go off to children's and worship, let's take a look at the Easter basket here. I have some eggs in here, okay? Shall we find out what's in them? Okay, it's not candy, I'll tell you that, okay? It's not candy, all right? But let's find out what's inside. So I'm going to take my green one first. Okay, hear that? All right, okay. Someone want to help me open that? Okay, come on for it. Yeah, come. All right, can you open it? What's in there, John? What's in there? A cross. A cross. Oh, yeah, there's a wood cross in there. Little wood cross, okay? All right, you can see that? Little wood cross. Okay, so we got a cross. All right, let's see. Next one, I'm going to grab my purple one. Okay. Oh, that's a different sound. Okay, different sound. Oh, one of the things is trying to sneak out the hole in it. That's not good. All right. Someone want to help me open that? Someone help? Okay. I want to open it. What's in there? Careful. What's in there? What's this? Nails. They're nails. Yes, they're nails. There's three nails in there. Exactly. See that? Three nails. Good job. Okay. So we got a cross. We got three nails. Then I'm going to take my blue one. Okay, here's my blue one. Oh, that's a different sound. Okay, different sound. All right. Okay, someone want to help me open that? Want to help me with that? Come, yep. Yeah. All right, Emma. What's inside there? A rock. A rock. A stone is in there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we got a stone in there. All right, that's the, that's the blue one. Okay, we got that. All right. Oh, my egg doesn't want to come back together. There we go. And one more. Okay, one more. Okay, we got the white one. Listen. Peter, do you want to come help me? What's in there? What's in there? What do we have? Nothing. Nothing. It's empty. Yep, the egg is empty, okay? Now, these eggs help tell us the Easter story. Christ died on a cross, and he was nailed there, right, by his hands and his feet. But then when they buried him in the tomb, they sealed it with a a rock, a stone, a big stone, right? But then he rose from the dead, and then the grave is, is empty, okay? That's the Easter story that we get to celebrate for seven Sundays, okay? All right. Remember your, your part here in just a minute, okay? And also with you, you got to say it nice and loud, okay? Congregation, what's our prayer for these children? The Lord be with you. Good job. Go in peace. Before we go to prayer this morning, just a reminder that if you ever have a prayer request, you can fill that out in the card that's in the pew. It's on the back side of the sermon note cards. And you can drop that into the wood box at the back of the narthex on the Welcome Center. The prayer team welcomes those. They keep them confidential and they will gladly pray for you. Psalm 118 is traditionally known as the psalm for Easter, and it will assist us in our prayer, the response that's printed in your order of worship. I invite you to listen for, your, for my part that I pray, and then you'll respond to the part in bold. And that verse 14, that's what that is, that verse 14 is an exact quote from the words used in the song sung after the Israelites made it through the Red Sea. They were celebrating a great victory, part of God's redemption story. And while that is a great victory, it pales in comparison to the victory we have when Jesus rose from the dead. So in this Easter season, let's have that on our minds and in our hearts as we come to God in prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, we come to you this morning giving you thanks because you are so good in so many ways. 
One of those ways is giving us the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, the one who was born in a stable, lived as our example on this earth, suffered and died in our place, and then rose from the dead on Easter morning. We thank you that we can celebrate Christ's resurrection not just on one day of the year, but throughout this whole Easter season and throughout every day of our lives. We thank you that Jesus' grave was empty when the women went to the tomb and that his grave will be empty forever. We thank you that because of Christ's resurrection, all those who place their hope in you will inherit the gift of eternal life. You, Lord, are our strength and our song. You have become our salvation. And we thank you that, that gift of eternal life is available to all those who mourn and grieve. We pray that you would bring comfort to the families in our, congrega in our congregation who are grieving. We think of the entire Versluis family and the death of Joyce Versluis. Father, bring them your peace and your comfort. We pray for Ellen Wieringa and her family and the death of her father. And we pray that you would comfort her and her loved ones as well. Lord, our God, for all those who grieve and mourn, no matter how long ago the death has been, in your faithfulness, may you continue to pour out your mercy and grace. We thank you for your faithfulness to Reverend Bill Van Dyke, who will celebrate his 94th birthday. We thank you, Father, for all the ways you used him through his ministry and the ways you continue to use him to influence others yet today. We thank you, too, for the birth of Margot Lindley Mustert and Levi James Hahn. We pray, Father, that even in those young ages, you would start to move by your Spirit in their hearts to point them to you. Lord our God, you are our strength and our song. You have become our salvation. Loving Father, we think of those who are experiencing health challenges. We pray that you would be with them so they will not be afraid. We pray that you will be with them and be their helper. We thank you that Marlon Arnois is doing well after his stroke and pray that you would continue to grant him complete recovery. We pray that therapy for Mary Geertzma will continue to go well at Mary Freebed. And we pray, Father, that you would grant her your peace in the days ahead. May healing continue to be upon Ed Huxima. Grant him strength and healing. Father, encourage him in each day that lies ahead. May you grant complete recovery to Hattie Patterson, who has struggled with pneumonia. We thank you that she's back home. And we pray for Renee Kuyper and their entire family as she looks forward to chemo treatments. Lord our God, when we look at the categories listed in our bulletin, those who are fighting cancer, those who have continuing needs, those who are receiving services from hospice, for the people that are listed in these categories and the ones who are not, we pray and we bring them to you. For you, Lord, are our strength and our song. You have become our salvation. God of all creation, we think too of situations around the world that weigh upon our hearts. We think of those who are refugees and asylum seekers. We lift especially before you those in Hungary who are ministered to by Jeff and Julie Bauman, our missionaries with Resonate. Bless their work, Father, as they work with the Reformed Church there in Hungary. We pray for peace with the war in Ukraine, and we also pray for peace with rising tension and conflict in the Middle East. Father, take hold of each leader involved in that situation, and may they surrender their lives to your will and not to their own interests or decisions. Father, we also pray, as you taught us to pray for our enemies. We pray for those who are persecuting others simply because their faith in Jesus Christ. 
Father, help them not to be discouraged. For you, Lord, are our strength and our song. You have become our salvation. Father, the religious leaders in Jesus' day persecuted him and sought to destroy him. Yet he has become our cornerstone. You, Lord, have done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You, Lord, have done it, and we can rejoice and be glad. But we pray for the spread of the gospel so more people can rejoice and be glad. Use organizations like Reframe Ministries and Words of Hope as they seek to, seek to bring the gospel, both in this land and across the world. We pray for a blessing upon the outreach ministries here at LaGrave, as well as those that continue in this neighborhood. And use us, Lord our God, as your people, to shine the light of Jesus to those who have never heard, to those who are wandering, to those who have stopped even being part of a church. May many more come to know that you, Lord, are our strength and our song. You have become our salvation. We ask all this in the name of your Son, our risen Savior, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Sweet 
Friends, the Lord be with you. Thank you. Uh, good to be with you. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity. So I thought um, this being Eastertide, as Chad has reminded us so ably, uh, I wanted to preach something to do with the resurrection, and specifically uh, a passage of some of the implications of the resurrection. Um, and I should perhaps explain the scripture reading. You may know uh, that the chapter and verse divisions in our Bibles aren't original. They only date from the 16th century when Bibles began to be printed. And the story is that actually the New Testament was divided up by a Swiss printer. I think his name was Stephanus or something. Uh, who did a lot of the work while he was riding horseback. And it's, it's possible his pen may have slipped once or twice. So uh, it's, it's useful to have these uh, reference points, and we use them all the time. I mean, what would those people do at the stadium if they couldn't hold up John 3.16 on a sign, you know? But um, not original. And sometimes they break the flow of an argument. So I have a reason for combining the end of 1 Thessalonians 4 and the beginning of 1 Thessalonians 5, and perhaps you'll guess it before I tell you. Uh, before I read, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern this day and every day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beginning at verse 11, 1 Thessalonians 4. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed, literally ignorant, Paul says, about those who sleep in death, literally those who've fallen asleep in Jesus, so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we don't need to tell you, uh, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness, so then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, 
we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. And the link is the word parakleta, uh, which occurs in verse 18 of chapter 4. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And verse 11 of chapter 5. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Parakleta. And since I know you folks here at LaGrave know your Bible, I think some of you are hearing paraclete in that word, and you're right. It's the word Jesus uses in John 14 to describe the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom he promises uh, to ask the Father to send and who does fall on the company of his followers, and whom he describes in John 14 as the form in which or the means by which he himself will come to them. He dwells in us through the paraclete, through the comforter. Often translated encourager or uh, Eugene Peterson in the message translates uh, verse 18, Therefore, reassure one another with these words. And you, you get the idea, you get the sense, the church is intended to be a community of mutual encouragers, of those who build one another up. Our forebearers in the faith would have used the word edification, a great old word. We build each other up. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why we need the church, because the opposite of comfort is sorrow or distress or grief, and we all go through that. The opposite of encouragement, of course, is discouragement, lethargy, torpor, uh, and we all experience that. So we need the church. We need one another. That's what Worship is supposed to be for, not just to offer our praise and thanks to God, yes, certainly, but also to be encouraged as God's word is shared with us. Uh, Mutual encouragement. So that's what it's all about, and it's all premised on one fundamental fact. Brothers and sisters, We don't want you to be ignorant of those who are asleep so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, therefore, it's all uh, built on the foundation that Jesus died and rose again, that it's true, that uh, it's not just a fantasy or a sort of vague hope. It's something that happened in the world of space and time. It really happened. Uh, My pastor has a habit, uh, a, a really good habit, of before delivering the benediction at most services, and he's a fine preacher, by the way, um, of of simply reminding the congregate, remember, we live in a world where a resurrection has happened. We live in a world where a resurrection has happened. Um, Maybe like you, when Tim Keller died a couple years ago now, you found yourself going back and revisiting uh, what a gift he was to the church at large, to Reformed Christians especially, Uh, gifted preacher, gifted teacher, gifted writer. I found myself rereading an old interview he did in 2007. He had been diagnosed uh, in something like 2002 with cancer, and he had a period of enforced idleness, of inactivity, something like six months. And he said in this later interview that he took out 
N.T. Wright's book on the resurrection of the Son of God. In fact, I was so inspired, I took my copy out, which I had barely cracked open, and started reading. I, I haven't finished it. Uh, it's 738 pages. Anyway, Keller said he read that whole thing during those six months, and when he finished it, he slammed the book shut and set it down, and, and he said, it really happened. I get it. I mean, he believed that. He had believed it and preached it his whole life. But it suddenly came home to him again. It really happened. People. Just because we're used to it, just because we say Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, hallelujah. It happened. It's true. And that landed like a bombshell in the world of the first century. Listen to this passage. Um, I've got a few quotes for you today. This is from a book by an early 20th century biblical theologian named James Denny. There is not in the New Testament from beginning to end in the record of the original and genuine Christian life a single word of despondency or gloom. It is the most buoyant, exhilarating, and joyful book in the world. The men who write it have indeed all that is hard and painful in the world to encounter, but they are of good courage because Christ has overcome the world. And when the hour of conflict comes, they descend crowned into the arena. All this is due to their faith in Christ's exaltation and in his constant presence with them in the omnipotence of his grace. Brother, that's, you said a mouthful. So, Paul wants to begin with encouraging words concerning our loved ones who've died in Christ, who've fallen asleep in his beautiful phrase. And this was especially apropos for the Thessalonians because they were among the earliest Christian converts. In fact, 1 Thessalonians is in all probability the earliest book of the New Testament to be written. So if we ar ar arranged our New Testament in the order of writing, uh, Revelation would still come at the end. It might have a run for its money with Jude, but anyway, back there. First Thessalonians would come first. Head of the class. So it, it wasn't even 20 years since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And in their first burst of enthusiasm and faith and sense of victory, that exhilaration that Denny wrote about, they were convinced that they were going to greet him on his return. It was about to happen any day. And then, when some of them in the natural course began to die, it raised difficult and painful questions. What does this mean? Does this mean they're lost somehow? Does this mean they weren't really part of us? That somehow their faith was defective? What do, what does it mean? And Paul writes to encourage them, to reassure them, to comfort them. This is how you are to think of those whom you love who've fallen asleep in Jesus. And he says three things about them. The first is a, a negative. They haven't perished. They haven't been lost. You grieve, yes, we all grieve. Grief is natural. It is a human response to loss. There's something wrong if we don't grieve. But it's not hopeless. Because the world into which the gospel came with this bombshell message was a world utterly without hope in the face of death. I, years ago, I copied out some, of the, some tomb inscriptions from the ancient world. They build these lavish monuments, and they'd inter the bones of illustrious dead or wealthy dead, common people, you know. You know how it is with common people. They don't get squat. But the, the wealthy would adorn these tombs, 
but the inscriptions that they put on Listen to a few of them. Child, be not overly distressed. No man is immortal. I was not, I was born, I lived, I am not. That is all. All we are kept for death, fed like a herd of swine that are butchered without rhyme or reason. My favorite, my personal favorite, this one. Here lie I, Dionysius of Tyre, 60 years old, unwed, would that my father had been the same. <laughs> Clever, you know. But what he's really saying is, I wish I'd never lived. I wish I'd never lived. Uh, uh, an ancient Greek philosopher named Theocritus wrote this, hopes are for the living, the dead are without hope. There it is, period. And Paul says, <laughs> No, we, we're not without hope. Because those who've died in Christ haven't perished. You, you remember how he puts it in that wonderful little section of 1 Corinthians 15, the counterfactual thing, where he says, what if Christ hasn't been raised? What then? Well, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is useless and you're still in our sins and those who've fallen asleep in Jesus have perished. But, in fact... What? Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hey, come on, come on, come on. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah, say it with emphasis. We live in a world where a resurrection has happened. It really happened. So the dead haven't perished. What then? Now this is really interesting. Because he doesn't say, I want you to have hope, I don't want you to grieve hopelessly because your loved one has died and gone to heaven. Instead, he starts talking about the second coming. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. And then he goes on to describe that day, that dramatic, cataclysmic, un missable, unforgettable day. No, it's not going to slip in kind of quietly when you're not looking and no one's going to realize it. No, no. The sound of a trumpet, the cry of command, the shout of the archangel, and the Lord will return. And with him he will bring all those who have died in him, died in faith. But the inference is that if, we're gonna, if he's going to bring them with him, they're with him now, right? And, and in fact, that's what Paul will say later on in one of his last letters, the letter to the Philippians, famously, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. Those whom we love are not dead, their bodies are dead, they are with him, and they're not, not some kind of soul sleep. That's an invalid inference from Paul's metaphor about falling asleep. Not that they're unconscious, not that they're in some kind of suspended animation like astronauts flying to Mars, asleep in their little pods, you know, in every sci-fi movie. No, they're with him. They're living with Christ now. What does he say in chapter 5, verse 10? He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, dead or alive, we might live with him. Remember what Jesus said in another context? He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. So, our loved ones are alive with Christ right now. Their bodies sleep in death, but they are alive. Now, that raises a lot of questions, a lot of things we'd love to know. Do they see us? Are they looking down on us? Every time that ball player points up when he hits a home run because grandpa's watching, is that true? Can we pray to them? Should we ask for the intercessions of the saints? I don't know. <laughs> the New Testament writers seem strangely uninterested in the details of the intermediate state. It's enough for them, apparently, 
to know that they're with the Lord, that they are alive in Him and living with Him. And as for the details, well, I think we need to allow our imaginations to be disciplined by Scripture and just leave it at that. But here's the third thing. <laughs> so they haven't perished. They're, live, they're alive with Christ in some sense, in some way, in some dimension. And we will be reunited, yes, because when he returns, he will bring them with him, and they're not in any way going to miss out. They're not going to, nobody's going to get ahead of anybody else. They will ride the dead in Christ. And incidentally, Paul's clear implication is that some of us are going to be alive, still living on earth in this. Well, boy, wouldn't that be great? Come, Lord Jesus. You can skip the whole thing and just be transformed. And together, we will meet the Lord in the air. There's the rapture, folks. Uh, but it's not the rapture. Not <laughs> um, so let me quote N.T. Wright on this from his book on the resurrection of the Son of God that I'm slowly working through. Um, it's not that the church is going to be secretly snatched away and taken up to heaven. Rather, the image is of the visit of a, of a Roman official, maybe even the emperor, if the emperor was coming to the city, when the whole population would stream out to welcome this honored guest and accompany him back into the city. So Wright writes this, the point here is that the meeting refers not to a meeting after which all the participants stay in the meeting place, but to a meeting outside the city after which the civic leaders escort the dignitary back into the city itself, indicating not that believers will be taken away from the earth, leaving it to its fate, but that, in the language of apocalyptic imagery, not in literal spatial reality, in other words, don't get hung up on the floating up and floating down and all that. That's imagery. As Wright points out, um, the New Testament just as often speaks of Christ's appearing as it does of his coming. He's still here. We just can't see him. Uh, they will meet the Lord as he comes from heaven and surround him as he comes to inaugurate God's final transformative judging and saving reign on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. What a day. The day of the Lord. So encourage one another with these words. And then Paul takes an interesting pivot. And I I got to say, bear with me for a few minutes, because as I was thinking through this, um, I thought about the Gettysburg Address. Now, maybe you had to memorize that as I did in, middle, in grade school, uh, junior high, we called it then, it's, right? Middle school. Uh, interesting. You, you, maybe you know this story. You should know this story. Everyone should know this story. So, the civic leaders decided after the climactic battle of Gettysburg, thousands dead, left on the field, hastily buried, they decided to dedicate um, a section as a cemetery for those who died in the battle, the Union dead. They didn't care about the Confederate. Um, and so right adjacent to the town cemetery on Cemetery Hill, they they set apart this ground, and they decided to have a big ceremony in November of 1863. They invited Edward Everett of Massachusetts to come and give the principal address. He was a stemwinder. He spoke for two hours in his oration. Uh, and then, rather belatedly, somebody said, well, maybe we should invite the president, too. So they sent an invitation to Lincoln and said, you can make a few remarks, a few remarks. They're known as the Gettysburg Address, right? And Lincoln, in his two minutes or so, some people in the crowd didn't even realize he had started by the time he finished, um, 
said something about dedicating the ground. It's appropriate. We should, this is great. But they, they, of course, already dedicated it themselves by giving their lives. And then, in the middle of his two minutes, he pivots to the living. And he says, it is for us, the living rather, to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. So, pure genius. Let's talk about us who are alive, not about the dead. Let's talk about our dedication. And basically what he says is, we got to win the war. Everything depends on that. And that is pretty much what Paul says uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, you know that great day? I'm not going to get into the when and the where and all that uh, because we don't know anyway. And besides, it's going to happen unexpectedly. It's going to be like a midnight break-in. It's going to be like the onset of labor. And no matter how prepared you think you are, it's still going to catch you by surprise. And then he starts to play with the imagery of dark and light. Dark and light. You know, bad things happen in the dark, but we're not people of the darkness. We're people of the light. We need to stay awake. We need to be sober. We need to put on the armor of faith, hope, and love. He comes back to that. He mentioned it in chapter one. It all comes down to that, faith, hope, and love and live as if it's light already. We're like the land of Goshen during the ninth plague. Remember that? This eerie darkness falls all over Egypt, but the light shines where God's people are. That's what he's calling us to. Not to pull an all-nighter. When he says, um, stay awake uh, and be sober, He's not saying, well, you got to pull an all. He's saying, get up before daybreak and live as if the light is already dawn because the day is coming. Even when there's darkness all around you, we can be light. Sleepers awake. (laughs) Uh, Do you know the the famous story? Uh, Do I have time? Yeah, I have a couple minutes. St. Augustine's conversion. You know, he was struggling with faith. He didn't want to quite commit. He was living the life of a leisured Roman gentleman in Milan. He was in a garden of a friend one day, and he had a a copy of um, Romans, the book of Romans, open that he had been looking at. And he heard a voice outside the garden wall, a child apparently playing some kind of game, saying, tole lege, tole lege, tole lege, pick it up and read pick it up and read. And he said, whoa. So he picked up the book he had been reading and his eyes fell on these words, Romans 13. You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarrels and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And that did it. He was converted. So, can I leave you with these encouraging words? Actually, I found some that I like from Hosea. Hosea chapter 6. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, um, we want to walk as children of the light. We want to follow you. We want to be 
encouragers, not discouragers. We wa want to welcome all who are walking in darkness and invite them to join us in your light. And when that includes us as we stumble or stray, please recall us to yourself and may you be glorified in and through us. In your name, amen. Friends, hear this good news. We live in a world where a resurrection has happened. So go in peace now to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.